Um, there have been three magnificent conferences, two in London, one in Gdansk. Uh, last year we had a lovely event in Rome, and in two years' time I think we're moving to Oxford next year. September. Next year, right. And across these conferences we have been considering the relationship between spirituality and literature, spirituality and culture, though more specifically um, spirituality and poetry. So we're here tonight to celebrate three volumes which encapsulate the proceedings of the three successive conferences. Um, the first was Poetry and the Religious Imagination, then Power, Poetry and Prayer, thirdly poet Poetic Revelations. We have the three books, they're all for sale are they? Yeah. On the table and maybe purchased for the magnificent price of 20 pounds. So we have to think really about uh, words and spirituality and maybe music, bearing in mind that we've just celebrated Mass in the chapel. And I was listening with great attention to Michael as he was preaching on the theme of silence. And I was lurking at the back because I was co-opted at the last minute into the Scuola Cantorum to sing the Gregorian chant. And as I did so, I was reminded of an, a, an episode about 20 years ago when I went to Evensong in the Chapel of King's College, Cambridge, when the whole service was sung the Gregorian chant. And I've done this myself. And of course, singing evening prayer in the Anglican church involves singing the Psalms. And when you sing the Psalms to Gregorian chant, there's one interesting feature that we don't actually have in Anglican chant which is you leave a pause, you leave a, leave a silence, not between the verses, but in the middle of each verse. And I was very struck by this when I listened to Kings beautifully singing this. So I wrote a letter to Philip Ledger, who at that time was the director of music, and I asked him, firstly, what is the purpose of this silence? Secondly, how long is it supposed to last? And thirdly, what are the origins of this particular custom? And he very kindly sent me a letter saying he wasn't sure of the origins of this custom, but he did know as a director of music how long the silence should last. And it was sufficiently long for the audience or the congregation to be able to say three Hail Marys between the two halves of the verse. And it struck me this is rather like a caesura in a poetic line, actually. You've got a silence scripted in. But it is not an empty silence. It is a silence which is brimful of meaning and words because people are silently praying as they listen and they attend to the silence. Um, I'm just wondering whether this is something we couldn't relate to poetry. And we've held quite a bit over the last couple of days about poetry and silence and words and spirituality. Um, the three volumes that we are having a look at all have poetry in the title. We have all of the editors here in this sexy lineup. And I wanted to ask them really what poetry has uniquely as, as a clue to spirituality that maybe other literary genres don't have. Uh, this afternoon we were talking about King Lear, so there's quite clearly a lot to be said about poetry and drama. Um, maybe you might run a future conference on poetry in the detective novel, I don't know. It might run and run and run, but all literary genres have a kind of spiritual content. But what is it uniquely about poetry, really, that focuses the attention, do you think? Yeah, just on the spur of the moment, the only thing I can think of is just exactly that, that it, it focuses the attention, uh, or it has the, the capacity to do that. Um, just to make us stop and... To make us and stop. Stop and stare, right. as someone yesterday was saying. Mm -hmm. And that um, doesn't happen in drama? Sorry, I'm putting the wrong spot here. Uh, <laughs> It's the um, density of the form, I suppose, really, the, you know, the conciseness of the form that uh, means it has that capacity. No, no, I mean, other literary forms also obviously do, but, um, but maybe this in a particular way, just because of the, 
it's because of its density and its um, and its conciseness. Mm. I was thinking about the materiality of the poem, the fact that it itself is an object. In drama, we are carried by action. In narrative, we are carried by things happening. In poetry, as Jean said, we, we are invited to stop and look. Uh, and I also thought about uh, the fact that if one reads poetry, one uh, also notices uh, an awful lot of uh, empty space around words yeah. on the page. Yeah. Uh, so it is, um, it uses silences and words or uh, sounds in uh, a manner that is similar to music. Uh, that this uh, correspondence between the word spoken and uh, the, the white space around it uh, which is silence, um, is as important as anything else. I would add to that too that I think you could talk about poetry as a, as a seductive art because it draws us both into ourselves and beyond ourselves, which is what happens with seduction if we take, take it away from the moral uh, sense of seduction. We're, we're, we're taken into ourselves and we're brought out of ourselves towards some other. And it's, it's that reaching toward the other that shapes our soul, that gives us a cause of delight, of puzzlement, of wonder, sometimes of frustration. A good poem should frustrate, it should slow us down, it should resist. Uh, being completely explained. It doesn't want to be completely explained. It wants to be delighted in. It wants to be, it wants to be delicious on our tongues and in our minds and to haunt us as well, to haunt us, to... A good poem, a line of a good poem carries us in the darkest of nights and, and in the brightest of days. Probably the same line sometimes. What was the phrase, raids on the inarticulate? Um, which is a, a description of, of poetry. I think it's, and it, it has the idea that you were talking about this morning, Mark, of re language reaching out beyond itself um, to something which is, which is unexpressed, inarticulate, but somehow known or somehow grasped. And I think um, poetry through the, both through the forms and through the images that are used. It's a, it's a way of thinking with images, mm -hmm. which images which kind of suggest something beyond themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and a way of knowing which is not, it is verbal, but it's not just verbal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it has, a, it has a logic to it, but it's not the logic of the syllogism. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a way of moving through thought um, which is suggestive of a kind of a form of knowledge beyond itself. So many things have been said about what poetry is, why poetry matters and what constitutes poetry, and we have na named all of them. Um, spirituality is, again, another very difficult word, because how do we define spirituality? So going back to what you were asking, why what is our interest in poetry and spirituality? I don't think that was probably the main um, focus or the reason why this whole project of Power of the Word started. It was not so much to stress. We did do that with poetry and prayer, yeah. prayer coming yeah. under Christian spirituality, but it was a way of reappropriating in a little bit in the philosophical, theological background literature and poetry in particular. It happened to be poetry because more people sent in papers about poetry. So it's not that we started saying we want to study what poetry is, what poetry does, and why poetry can be um, you know, said to be very close to spirituality. It's starting from, you know, we want to reappropriate um, in a way to a, theological and philosophical background and also spiritual background. We were wanting to set up 
um, conversations between scholars uh, of literature, theology, philosophy, spirituality, and so on. So the, the idea of a, a continuing conversation was an important one too. And um, in the introductions and the, the kind of the uh, manifestos for each of the conferences, that was, that was stressed that it was a, a matter of encouraging and um, developing and uh, really kind of fostering conversations between people from different fields, scholars, but also creative artists as well, uh, poets, novelists, and, and so on. So that was, that was an important element in the, the original idea too. Just, just I wanted to say that maybe there was some significance in the fact that the papers that were sent in in answer to this appeal were mostly about poetry. I mean, that, does, that wasn't just accidental. Um, I didn't attend all of these conferences, but I attended the last one in Rome, and it had a completely unique atmosphere. Partly, of course, because it was in Rome, which is a very pleasant place to visit. But also because one suddenly realized there was a spiritual consensus in the room. Suddenly one was talking to fellow Christians, suddenly one was talking to people, not, whom, not all of whom were Catholic, but all of whom appreciated the Catholic tradition and knew what it stood for. And in some ways, the Catholic tradition was central to their lives, whether they were artists or scholars or poets, whatever they were. And one is so used, I think, in Western academe to be talking to a secular audience, to secular colleagues, to secular students who know very little about religion at all, and if they know anything at all about it, tend to despise it, because that is the consensus in the world now. And it strikes me that one of the great things that this conference series has done is actually to clear a space for a religious discourse in the literary academy, which apart from that doesn't really exist. So in a sense, there's something resistant about this project. You're resisting all of that pressure and you're saying what you really believe. Do you think that's another important element? Yes. And just I wanted to add that this brings us back to Michael Paul and what he thought what, you know, was important to do, to reach out and, and to create bridges yes. rather than you know, become defensive and inward looking. And I think it's, I, I find it very rewarding doing this uh, within the academia and uh, people did appreciate what, and do appreciate what we are doing. I think too, one of the, the striking components of the conferences over the years is the role of the arts and the role of poets. That is, uh, at the first conferences already, there we had an evening uh, with poets, not simply talking about poetry, but uh, uh, in, invited guests reading their poetry and um, absorbing it. I mean, I don't think that, that you could find a better audience than this group for poetry reading. Uh, but that's been a striking component, that there's been both the secondary discourse about poetry uh, and the arts, but then the primary discourse of the poet speaking, the poet reading, the poet reflecting. And for me, at least, that was an unusual departure from a typical kind of academic conference. Uh, that, it's very true, and I think uh, I remember David and I discussing this. Um, this is um, another reason, you know, the reaching out, why should creative writers and poets not come, you know, into uh, consideration in the academic world, which is mainly analyzing mm -hmm. poems rather than really listening or creating space for creative writers. There's a, a book that, that utterly changed my life when I read it in 1989, and I'm sure many of you will know the book by George Steiner, he's been mentioned. Not entirely, not, not entirely, entirely flatteringly earlier today, but um, the book is called Real Presences, plural. And when it came out, it created, I think, a kind of minor storm in the field of academic, the academic study of literature and of the arts and of culture. And Steiner begins with a parable uh, in which he invites us to imagine a city where there is no secondary discourse about the arts where people aren't analyzing the arts, they're experiencing the arts, and it's somewhat contrived. But a beautiful, I think these conferences for me have been closer to that 
a city where the secondary discourse, talking about the arts, has had a kind of primary reverence, attentiveness to the arts, and a, a, a willingness to be guided, to be carried uh, by, by a poet, by a poem, uh, and to see where that leads. And that's utterly different than the Modern Language Association uh, in the United States, where there's not much talk about literature, there's talk about theories of literature, and meta-theories of literature, and meta-meta, theories of, and anti-meta theories of literature, but literature is almost lost completely. This is a place where literature lives in its own voice, and I've treasured that. I was also thinking about, um, because um, Francesca spoke about uh, the, uh, this, the space of this conference as a space where um, differences are um, acknowledged, but at the same time not sustained in a defensive manner. I was thinking about, uh, uh, one more division that uh, seems very persistent at the academia, and that is precisely the division between uh, the, uh, different disciplines. That is, one st studies either philology or theology or philosophy, and uh, you're uh, strictly forbidden uh, to, um, to trespass on somebody else's area. Uh, whereas it is precisely uh, um, it is precisely because of the theological reading of poetry or um, you know, philosophical reading of poetry and, 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 and the connections that we make them, uh, it is precisely because of that that poetry starts to live because it, it ceases to be an object of, um, uh, of study, of uh, philological research. Mm -hmm. But it becomes a space of um, open meditation and, and, and uh, the exchange of ideas. It, it becomes a space of dialogue only then. Uh, otherwise, we just study poetry for its own sake, and it, it is like a post-mortem uh, analysis of, uh, of a dead poem. Um, uh, uh, but, 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 uh, but here in those conferences, um, words were breathing. They were breathing because of, of, uh, of the insights that came from other disciplines. <laughs> Yes, well, uh, and uh, I suppose an adjacent experience to that would be uh, me trying to write about T.S. Eliot in my own, own university, and I was uh, supposed to be producing a course unit on the four quartets, which is one of my favourite sequences of poems. And when I think of the four quartets, uh, well, the first thing I did, actually, was, a, with a bit of help from Francesca, to go and visit three of the sites. I couldn't go to the dry salvages without getting terribly wet and taking along <laughs> my swimming costume. But we did go to Burnt Norton together, didn't we? And we didn't get burnt. But then I went to East Coca. I didn't tell you about that. I went to East Coca. Yes, and I didn't take you along. I'm far broken. And uh, two weeks ago, I went to Little Gidding. Little Gidding. Um, having done that, I then sat down and started writing about the four quartets. And of course, I immediately, because they're starting about four quartets and I have a bit of a musical background, I started thinking about quartets and started thinking particularly about late Beethoven string quartets and comparing the structure of T.S. Eliot's quartets to Beethoven's quartets. And the other thing, of course, struck me was connections between T.S. Eliot's quartets and various traditions of mysticism, which after all are invoked in the poems themselves. This completely scandalized all of my colleagues. <laughs> I was expected to say, A, T.S. Eliot is anti-Semitic, <laughs> B, that he's a fascist, C, that he's misogynistic, and really spirituality and music come right at the back of the queue. Now, if you're actually considering T.S. Eliot's quartets in this kind of context, the music and the poetry and the mysticism is at the front of the queue. The, sec the reigning secular um, discourse in academy at the moment puts mysticism and poetry and sound and music right at the back of the queue. So it strikes me that you've reorganized our priorities for us in an admirable way. So thank you very much indeed. Um, I want to really ask you where you think this conference um, uh, 
sequence, procession of conferences might be leading. I know that the next one in Oxford is on prophecy. Prophetic voice. The prophetic voice. I want the prophetic word. The prophetic word, okay. Um, and I suppose that there are future subjects for future conferences in your mind. But before I actually ask that of, of, of this assembly here, are there any questions to the editors from the floor of the house? The part of the word, actually, rather than part of the word, and as you mentioned, described it, came to me, to us, as from Carl Vrana, like that said, the parola. So the word through which, in more thinking about the reader, yes, of course, the words have got to be beautifully, you know, sentences and so on, but it's that power that comes um, through, through that text, to the reader and you know helps and could be a vehicle of grace in that sense. That's why the English translation of Grazia and Parola, part of the word, doesn't really convey that. But what other translation can you find for that? Okay. Just just one word on enchantment because um, apart from the terrible tragedy, in my mind at least, of the election that we've come through in the United States, last week something happened of a whole different magnitude, and I think it touched many of us because of what's happened in the States at a level that we weren't really prepared for, and that was the death of one of the great poets of our time, Leonard Cohen. And Cohen, who has spent his life as a secular Jew, in the last years, year or year and a half, found his way back to his faith and. Um, Shortly before he died, in an interview, somebody asked him what was the most important thing he learned. And he said, I learned what the word hallelujah means. <laughs> and if you know Leonard Cohen, you know the song that he wrote in the 60s, which became, it enchanted a generation. It enchanted my generation, the broken hallelujah. And it, it, it wasn't the enchantment of luring us away from reality, it was a kind of, enchantment in the true sense of the word that takes us into the heart of reality. And I think Leonard Cohen did that for a generation, of which I'm a, a, a part, that can never be taken away from us. No matter what else happens in the insane <laughs> banality of the political theater that we've had to endure, there will be people who know, who've been enchanted by the broken hallelujah and what it stands for and what it reaches for. And for that, I think, it couldn't have been a philosopher, it couldn't have been a political uh, rhetorician. It had to be a poet of the depth and authenticity of a Leonard Cohen of blessed memory. May I just say one more thing? <laughs> yes, you <laughs> <can>. <laughs> Thank Take you. No, okay, yes, just about the um, enchantment question, because I realized when you were speaking, Gemma, that the title of the poem that I mentioned this morning that so fascinated um, Seamus Heaney in translation was actually Incantation. And the poem was about you know, what words can and cannot do. And even though maybe you might say that the conclusion of the poem is that words you know, can't do the things that we would like them to do, but still there's something about the fact that the poem has been written about that that's somehow cleansing to the imagination. <laughs> So, you know, it is a kind of enchantment, even if you're talking about the fact that the enchantment doesn't exactly work. So. Yeah.